course, kicking off with the chief judges training with uh, Shamsunda, followed by the eagerly anticipated session on how to write a winning speech to be conducted by this year's Toastmasters World Champion of Public Speaking. As with any training session in uh, Toastmasters or any event, indeed, the session is supported by an amazing team of role players. And I think we can see the role players up on the screen quite soon, if I'm not mistaken. Can we see a, a picture of the role players? There we go. Fantastic. So our main host for this evening is Toastmaster Bindu Pillai. Our co-host is, of course, Neshi Kumar. We have another co-host, Giridar KV. And our timer, who will be keeping everybody on track for the evening, hopefully, is Toastmaster Falsi. Uh, can we get a virtual round of applause, please, for everyone involved and all the role players who are going to be keeping this going to time on track and helping us have a very, very productive and efficient session. We also have a few uh, things, other things to mention. We have the district mission. Oops. There we go. So of course, our district mission is that we build new clubs and support all clubs in achieving excellence. And of course, tonight's session is a perfect example of something that this district is doing to, to achieve its mission over the course of the year. I'm very excited about it too. With the session, we're expecting lots more people as well to be online soon. We do have a few ground rules for you. If I could just have these up as well. Thank you, Bindu. First of all, if you could keep your microphone off, but your camera on. Microphone off, of course, to avoid any unnecessary disturbances and the camera on, of course, so that those speaking can see who they're speaking to. And we as an audience can also appreciate who is sitting in the audience with us and listening to the session. When speaking or if asking a question, there are a few topics that we have, uh, which are taboo here in Toastmasters in District 116, that is religion, politics and sex. So please avoid speaking on any of these topics. We would advise you to turn your Zoom settings to speaker view so that you can have the full experience of whoever is on your screen. And apologies if I'm full on your screen right now for my bad hair day, but the future speakers are going to be looking a lot better. So please keep it on speaker view rather than gallery view. And of course, some of you might have heard the session is being recorded, okay? Just for your information. There's one more thing I would like to uh, just quickly mention and that in both training sessions, I'm confident there'll be a multitude of questions uh, while listening to the session. So please send your questions, whether they occur to you during the session or at the end of the session, please send the questions in the chat box uh, to the relevant question and answer hosts who I will be introducing. Uh, the first question and answer host is uh, Bindu Unakrishnan and the second one is Toastmaster Falsi. So just please keep that in mind. When you have questions for the sessions, pop them in the chat box. Don't wait until the last minute. And of course, if you could keep them purposeful, short, straight and to the point. That's my personal recommendation to all of you. So it's my pleasure now to invite our district director to the screen. He's a keen gardener and cook, as many of you know. He's been a Toastmaster for 19 years. He served at club, area, division and district in various roles. And currently, of course, he's serving the members of the number one district. Yes, that is us, District 116, as the district director. Not only is he a Toastmaster, he's also an entrepreneur. He's co-author of the Amazon best-selling book, Decoding Communication, and he's a trader, to top it all off. Can I please welcome to the screen, Distinguished Toastmaster and District Director, Manzoor Moedin. Thank you so much, Master of Ceremonies, Toastmaster, Kirsty Walker, whom at one point I used to call Kirsty Walker, because I've saved your name so. Now, recently, I've changed that to Kirsty Walker. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction. I thoroughly enjoyed because I uh, was watching people nodding and saying, wow. Well, it was, of course, written by me. Thank you so much. A District 116 Program Quality Director, Distinguished Toastmaster Rajesh Visi, Club Road Director, Toastmaster Ravi Shankar J, a trainer and facilitator for today, Toastmaster Shamsundar. 
All our Toastmasters from around the world in District 116 that includes our division directors, we've got four of them, many area directors, club officers and members. A very good evening to all of you. We also have with us our past district director, the first district director of the number one district in the world, distinguished Toastmaster Rajeshwar Sundaresh, who has just joined. Last week, I had the fortune of meeting and interacting with the retired chief judge of the Andhra High Court in India, Mr. Kalyan Sundaram. During my stay in an Ayurvedic hospital where I was there for a couple of weeks treatment, and the evenings, we used to sit outside in the veranda while enjoying the rain, you know, ask him, I used to ask him many questions regarding his journey to becoming a chief judge in one of the biggest states in India, Andhra Pradesh. And he was mentioning about us here and how he reached to be, and he has been awarded a couple of, you know, coveted recognitions by the government of India for a service. So he's mentioning that it's not easy to be a chief judge in a high court of a state in India. You have to practice for about 10 years as an advocate in a high court. Then you need to be a judge for so many years. You need to be a magistrate and then a judge. And then finally, finally, or rather in between, attempt the exams, which are one of the most competitive exams conducted in India for the chief judges. Thankfully, in Toastmasters, we don't have such. We've got very straightforward, simple to the point training by our amazing trainers like Toastmasters Shamsundar, who will tell us what a chief judge in Toastmasters is all about. I was asking about being a chief judge. She said, of course, you know, you need to not only be fair, but also know all the legal points and to ensure there is parity in every word that he utters. Very meaningful, very thought-provoking. Even in Toastmasters, a chief judge is required, or rather, and I would say, must go through the process of judging at various levels to understand what judging is in Toastmasters speech contest. Number one point. Now, when you're a chief judge, some of my fellow members have asked me this question. It's just about facilitating or rather collecting the ballots from the judges and just tabulating. It's not just about tabulating the judging sheets, but much about that. Again, as Shamsundar mentioned initially, it's not about you know, uh, 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 petrifying you, saying that the role of a chief judge is very challenging. It is not, but it is definitely a wonderful experience to be a chief judge in any level of contest. Gives you a lot of exposure and experience. So I request all members attending this workshop, even if you've attended earlier, similar workshops for chief judges, to not just listen to Shamsunda, learn from it, but make sure that you practice it by being chief judge, by volunteering to be a chief judge at contest of different levels. Now it's contest season. So now we have the chief judging workshop followed by listening to our world champion of public speaking. Now, one of the goals or the objective of District 116 is to create a world champion of public speaking the next five years. Well, this goal was set three years ago. So we've got two more years to go. And we ensure that we district give the best of the best trainings for our members. Last year, if you remember, we had Michael Carr last year's 2020 World Champion of Public Speaking and addressing us. And this year, we have Variety who will be addressing us after this Chief Judging Workshop. Make the best of use of this session. And I congratulate our Program Quality Director and his entire team for organizing one such, along with our Judging Engagement Manager, Distinguished Toastmaster Sunil Kumar, men and wishing all the very best and looking forward for an enthralling session right from now.
Toastmaster Kirsty Walker. And I declare that this session is open. Thank you so much, Distinguished Toastmaster and District Director Nanzor. Fantastic. Are you all ready for the Chief Judge's training? Can I get some more thumbs up? Are you ready to enter the mysterious world that some of us already know, but some of us don't, many of us don't, and it should be clarified by the very experienced Sham Sundar. So our trainer for this session is the past division governor, DTAC 2020 chair, member of Philcom International Toastmasters Club. He's also a principal structural engineer by profession. He's tech savvy, we all know. He's an ethical hacker which I didn't know, and he's a backpack traveler by passion. So please help me welcome to the screen our Chief Judges Training Session Trainer, Toastmaster Shan Sunda. Thank you so much, Toastmaster Kirsty, for great introduction. Hello, Toastmasters and members of District 116 and other Toastmasters fraternity. Thank you and welcome to Chief Judge Training. I won't call it a workshop, but trip of training uh, tidbits. Um, as um, DTM Manzo, the district director mentioned, we, we are here not to frighten, but to enlighten you what chief judging is all about and what it takes to be a chief judge. And if you're a chief judge, what is it required? So let me just share my screen. Um, I'm not sure as spotlight is on. Yeah. Right. First and foremost, some myths I would like to demystify. Uh, first and foremost, chief judge is not that chief judge role which we predominantly have it in India. I'm so, sorry, excuse international audience, just for Indians, is not that. Chief judge here in Tosma is just exactly like how it happens in elsewhere, in the US, for example. We have a jury, and chief judge is a person who facilitates a fair judgment. That's about, all about chief judging here, right? Chief judge is a person who doesn't pass on any verdict, who doesn't hold any verdict, but he makes sure and ensures a contest is being done fairly. So for my training, given the uh, time of uh, 30 minutes, I divided my session into five segments, as you can see on the screen. I hope my screen is visible. Thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So first and foremost, let's see who can be a chief judge. If you're uh, very enthusiastic, you want to be a chief judge, let's see whether you can be a chief judge. Very well, you should be. And why do we need a chief judge for any contest and what it takes to be a chief judge or what all the requirements of a chief judge and how you can be a very effective chief judge and in summary, the summit of all. Fair enough, shall we go ahead? So I need a little of interaction, probably a thumbs up and whatever it is because I can see only my screen. It looks like I'm talking to a stone. So yeah, appreciate everybody. Yeah, thank you. Even that will help us. Who is a chief judge? Yes, the man you see, I wish it could be one, but not really. But Chief Judge is just, just any ordinary Toastmasters, fortunately or unfortunately. And I've divided who it can be into six segments. First two are, are as per the Toastmasters International Rulebook and remaining four are of my own from my experience. Again, take it or leave it there. First, at club level, who can be Chief Judge at club level? It's very simple. The chief judge has to be a paid member, period. That's about it. Experience, non-experience, those things doesn't count at the club level. However, the caveat will add on, but as per the rule book, that's page seven of clause D in your speech rule book, it says a paid member of the club and he or she should be present at the club contest. Fair enough? These are just two rules, simple. When it comes to area, division or district level, a member who would like to serve as a chief judge should be a member of Toastmasters International for at least six months. So minimum of six months of membership is required, continued membership is required. Secondly, he or she should have completed level one and level two of any path in pathways, or if he is coming from old school, he or she should have completed a complete and communicative manual for project six. And third one is common for both. He or she should be present at the contest. There's no virtual. I mean, virtually present or physically present, as the case may be, the contest. That's also in the same page seven as clause D, right? I believe these two are clear. Uh, I would encourage members uh, either to raise question, if you can raise hand, the contest uh, host can identify if it's a pertinent question, 
All the questions can be sent on the chat to the host. We'll collectively answer at the end, if that's okay with you. Now, remaining four are of my own. I have a few recommendations. Sorry. My personal recommendation is a chief judge who would like to be a chief judge, let he or she would have played a role of voting judges in all level of contests, any level of contests for that matter, only then, because you're going to lead a panel of judges, right? So you need to know through, go through the experience of being a judge yourself. So it's my strongest and humble opinion, and also strong recommendation that he or she should have been experienced as a voting judge or tiebreaker judge for that matter, before taking to chief judge. I think being a co-host, I'm getting the submit notification. My things, um, host, can you don't make me co-host? Just an honorary member, but allow me to screen share it, please. Because as the people are coming in, my things popping out and my control is uh, I'm losing my control. Host, close my window. Yeah. Uh, remove my co-host. Uh, we'll do. Let me know when I can continue. Yeah. Done. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Next, be familiar, familiar with the contest and nothing but contest. And everything that goes into concert, chief judge should be so familiar about. There is no room for saying that's not my role or I didn't know about that. These two words doesn't go well with the chief judge. Chief judge has to own the responsibility of the whole contest as a whole. Even though contest shall be playing his or her part, chief judge should be in control of the contest as a whole. And he or she should know the responsibility of each and every role player, be it judge, voting judge, tiebreaker judge, timer, ballot counter, sergeant terms, and even for that matter, contest chair inclusive. So the chief judge should be well-versed and familiar with the contest. And um, next, please, please, you need to dedicate time. And again, being busy, yes, in this world, yes, we all are busy, but again, be diligent and you need to require to dedicate a, dedicate a time for your role because chief judge in online contest, trust me and take this from me, that it's not just like a physical contest. Physical contest, to be honest, is much, much easier, but online chief judging is hard because your role starts a week for that matter, a month prior to the contest. So there is prior preparation, during contest, and post preparation. I'm going to come into that one. So please dedicate time during pre, during, and post contest. That's from my uh, experience. And last but not the least, chief judge, everybody is human. So we need to be sensible to whatever goes in the contest. It could be good, bad, ugly, nice, wonderful, fabulous, but all the whole, we need to be sensible in the decision we make because that decision is going to break or make a contestant and his experience as well. Is it right that sums up how, uh, who can be chief judge? With all this, yes. Bravo, let's go ahead with the next question. Why do we need a chief judge, right? That's a very blunt question, isn't it? Okay, uh, the picture doesn't mean much, but it's just to give a flavor on the visual effect, that's about it. First, why? First and foremost, so yeah. First and foremost, yes, it's a requirement. Toastmaster International Rulebook requires one, a chief judge, obviously, that goes without say. Second, to conduct a fair and level playing contest, a chief judge is required. Again, as I said, chief judge is not going to do any judging, but again, he facilitates the contest, facilitates a fair contest and judging as well. It's a member experience. It's an experience of the chief judge of yourself who plays the chief judge, also the experience for the audience and the contestants as well as a whole. A chief judge plays a very pivot role in making sure the contest experience is well for the member. Last but not the least, it's an opportunity for the leadership and growth in you. Not only you, you're also going to uh, aspire people and inspire them also take up this role in future. So how you conduct yourself going to determine your the future chief judges. So that's why we need a chief judge in a contest and what it takes to be chief judge and what all the things we require. I'm going to have this in two sessions. I'll have this boring part. I know it's a little boring, but we'll go to case study where we'll have an interactive decision. So hold on to it. First and foremost, uh, duties. Duties of a chief judge is to do 
uh, is to facilitate a fair judging and simply to facilitate for the judges to pick winner. No evaluation, no feedback, no things for improvement, all that, let it stay in the uh, club meetings, not in the contest. Contest, just pick the winner. Be very objective, no subjectiveness, be objective and pick the winner. That's for the judges and chief judge facilitate that. Responsibilities include in conducting the contest fairly. I keep reiterating this point because that says it all. Conduct, conducting a contest fairly is at most important and pick the winner. Second, responsible in adhering to the rule book. Your rule book is the holy grail. Stick to it word to word and no misinterpretation. And thirdly, responsible in handling of conflicts. Conflicts could be in any form and even the online uh, uh, format, the conflicts can come from any corner for that matter beyond our control. And lastly, but not least, complete all the paperwork required in the contest. We'll discuss about the paperwork or the chief judge need to go through. Again, as I said, leadership. It is to grow yourself as a chief judge once you take the role and exhibit what it takes to be a chief judge and inspire the future leaders to take up this role and grow. As our district director rightly said, it, it's not limited to a certain number of people who have been playing that and it's like, you know, it's a gramophone, right? We don't want that one. Let's bring some digital media into it. So we need more new chief judges and more new people taking up the role. It's not limited to some. So duties include here, it will be a little elaborate here. This is most important. If you are given the chief judge, let's say number A and number A is being appointed as chief judge, let's say Neshikumar. Neshikumar, don't mind for that. I'm just taking a name just to give an example. Yeah. So Neshikumar is given a role of a chief judge, what he should do. First, as I said, in online format, the chief judging role starts much, much ahead of the contest. Pre-contest preparation. Very important because that lays the foundation stone for the contest success. Preparation includes qualify and select judges. Now, who will select judges? I'm not going to get into that one because that's very subjective. Depends. Mostly, predominantly, uh, conventionally, the judges have been selected by the club, uh, the area or the division. Why I would say that? Because the judge who signs up for the role also signs up for the club. So that's also for the contest manager's role to exhibit his role, how he can experience in collecting. It's also a human factor, right? You discuss with the judges and get, get, ask them to sign up for the role. Again, it can be judges also. Now, qualify. How do you qualify? And you need to validate this is very, very important. The first point for that, our district has developed a beautiful tool, uh, DTM Surya and uh, Shekhar Tangavel really put on effort and they have done a nice tool that is to validate the judges. It's very simple and moreover, we, I encourage you to visit our district website. And this is our district website, by the way, I'm just marking the screenshot so you can see where to go and click on that. Validate the judges. You have the membership numbers of judge as well as contestants. You have in both the forms and then you can validate the judges using the tool. I'm not going to get into detail because we don't have much of time, but this is where you have to end up. Validate and qualify the judges. So you'll have a list of judges. Next, prepare forms. There are quite some forms you need to be prepare, preparing much in advance and getting it filled also much in advance and distribute to the judges and the role players. All the forms, again, our district website is a one-stop shop for all these resources. Please go to a website that you can see online contest resources. Here we can see all the ballot papers, the rule books, as well as the procedure and guidelines, which we have developed for our district particularly. So that's how it looks, procedure and guidelines for online contests. And we have also uh, issued an addendum as well last year before the DTAC. The next prior briefing, the briefing here, again, conventionally in in-person meetings, it starts at the contest, but for past two years, we have been seeing this one's not new to us, that the briefings start at least a week prior to the contest for the judges and all the role players. And chief judge, it's very important, unlike earlier days, you also need to participate in the contestant briefing. Why? It's important because you will form a bridge between the contestant and judges here. So if the timing guidelines is something you have briefed to your timers who comes under your briefing, the same, you may take the opportunity to brief the contest chair or the contestant directly during the briefing. I would uh, suggest my personal opinion, leave it to the contest chair, but make sure you let the contest chair know what you have briefed the timer. Is it understandable? So okay. So that means you're forming a bridge between these two. So it's important preparation. And during a contest, very simple role. Again, the briefing is you need to refresh all that what you brief. 
and monitor. Just be very, very vigilant. Please don't leave the meeting room virtually or in person while the contest is in progress and be vigilant how the contest is happening and keep a tap on all the judges. I don't know how you'll do it, but if possible, please. And post contest, um, again, in person, uh, collect all the ballots from the voting judges because here you are going to collect all the ballots yourself, not the ballot counters, unlike in physical contest. If it's a physical contest, we might return to the hybrid of physical contest. The ballot counters will collect the ballots for you, except the tiebreaker judge uh, ballot, which either the format of the contest, the chief judge will be collecting from the tiebreaker judge and timer sheet uh, as well. And tally the results. Again, how to tally the result, I'm not going to get into the details. You know that and probably you can have a different, more in-depth session with your areas. So do the tally, uh, tally the results online, virtually or offline if it's a hybrid meeting and submit the result notification form to the contest chair, sign and submit. And lastly, also fill the notification of contest winners. I wish I could show you an example in the winners notification as a chief judge, I've seen um, probably you're in a hurry. So we don't fill it fully. We just fill only the name, maybe not even the club name number, if it's an area division, just the name alone, we'll just fill and we'll give it to the next level. So I would really insist that we fill all the names and all the club numbers, including email and the phone number. This is important. This I practice, I would urge everyone practices this as well. For that matter, you need to collect all these details prior to the contest, you keep it ready. Now we're saying who can be chief judge, yes. And why do we need a chief judge and what it takes or what it is required to be a chief judge. Now comes the interesting part. How to be a chief judge? To be an effective chief judge, I have, we have developed a few uh, checklists, myself, Wengert, Philip, we all, Surya, we all were part of this. We developed a checklist first and foremost, attend the contest through a laptop as much as possible or a desktop, never, ever, I would really insist that never ever through your iPad, which would have a bigger screen for you, but the functionalities are limited, nor your mobile phone, definitely not as a chief judge, please, right? And ensure you have a decent internet connection and also audiovisual connectivity. I mean, it is checked also because you may need to interject in between when something's going on wrong or you need to pause the contest or do anything, you need to have a good internet because it could be a time when, let's say, for example, the announcement of results being happening and your net internet goes off, right? So what I mean, once the announcement of results made, that's final. Even if it's done wrongly, if it's not stopped and corrected timely, the announcement result is final. So it is so crucial that you have a good connectivity and enable the WhatsApp uh, in your system on a laptop rather than the phone because you're going to collect all the ballots through the WhatsApp system. And keep all the role players contact details in case of any um, emergency, you need to reach out to them very uh, um, um, instantly. So have all the contact details instant, um, instantly on hand because you won't have the opportunity to call the contest manager and, uh, and just have a trial there. Keep the result form and minute notification form, everything ready. Prior to contest, keep everything on a desktop, probably in the desktop or documents in a folder and it's um, accessible. Be familiar with the Excel sheet, the ballot counter sheet, the tally counter sheet, which you're going to share with the tally counters and going to tally the result. And double check the result form. Absolutely very crucial. That so happened in uh, our district as well before because the, the order of uh, the result notification order is different, as you may know. First is a third, second and first. It's not the way around. So it should be uh, checked correctly and passed on to the contest. Check once or twice. In fact, if you want, you can take the help of tally counters as well to check it as a second eye. And be available during the window notification. Yes, uh, three people are responsible or can be responsible in uh, correcting the mistake if its announcement is made wrong. One is a chief judge, one is a tally counter, and the third one is a timer. Timer will be limited only for time disqualification. Whereas at no, uh, I mean, the notification of winner row, the order would be can be corrected only by tally counters and chief judge. So, Please be attentive. Now, people think that chief, chief judge role comes into play only when there is a protest and disqualification. When the contest happens smooth and nice, yes, butter is smooth, everything's fine. 
people forget about it. So protest and disqualification is one of the primary role, if not the only role, I would say, because this we all pray and wish doesn't happen. If it happens, how the chief judge should handle himself and how the judges should have been briefed on the process so that there is no argument even between the judges as well. First and foremost, let's understand the protest and disqualification is limited only to these three. One is eligibility. Predominantly, the eligibility is checked by the contestor while collecting the eligibility form. However, if you may notice, the eligibility form should be handed over to the chief judge before the contest. It should also be made a practice. The chief judge should ask for the eligibility form and contest chair should also hand over all the eligibility form once checked to the chief judge. The chief judge is going to be custodian of those eligibility form. Second is on the originality. Originality is very subjective. And other contest speech, this is something added uh, recently, uh, two years before it's been added, because earlier they used to quote the prior uh, contestant speech. They take a tidbits from that speech, they repeat it, and then they build a speech upon that one. That's been seen as a cool effect or has been seen as a presence of mind effect. And they have scored also in past. I have seen myself. But however, that's been taken down uh, and then been seen as a protest for disqualification. So these three has to be uh, kept in mind. Next, to whom the protest can be lodged? The protest can be lodged only to the chief judge or contest chair prior contest adjournment. Again, here, the past, what happens, we have first day of contest before the rule book says it's before the announcement of result. Since the announcement of result happens later at the stage in a conference, let's say in DTAC, it happens in second day, the window for protest is being so long that it goes up to two days. And last uh, year, we also with PQD, uh, Manzur, we took a decision that it has to be stopped at the midnight. We can't keep it in it definitely. But this time, I think Toastmasters International have heard and they have made it very uh, clear, the contest adjust, uh, adjournment. When the contest adjournment happens is, let's say we have table topics contest, the contest finishes, announcement result is not been made, but still the contest chair has to adjourn the contest before moving on to the next contest. So that is known as a contest adjournment, right? The same day. The result can be announced even second day, third day, any part of the day, even after one week also, decision can be announced. But the, all the protests has to be lodged before the contest has been adjourned by the contest chair. I hope that's clear. And who can protest? Not anyone or everyone. The protest can be lodged only by the contestants or voting judges. Even the chief judge cannot protest for that matter, right? It's only the voting judges and the contestant. Now, let's see the process. I think uh, it's been I mean, briefed uh, much you know, elaborately and elsewhere, but I'll go through the process very quickly. First, and foremost, when a chief judge receives the protest through the contest chair or directly, it can be through contest chair or directly. First and foremost, contest chair need to qualify the genuineness of the protest. The chief judge should also collect the evidence. The chief judge is responsible to collect the evidence of the protest to see whether it's genuine. And then table it with all the voting judges after the ballots are collected. Why after the ballot collected? Because this protest is, should be kept confidential and it should not be known to anyone other than the one who made the protest and the chief judge or the contest judge that's about it. So that the judging happens fairly, fair and square. The ballots have been collected. In fact, ballots have been tallied and result also had to be tallied and kept ready. Only then the protest will be taken up. So if once the chief judge uh, verifies the genuineness of the protest and see there's a ground for protest, he tables with all the voting judges. Voting judges alone, not the tiebreak judge. Tiebreak judge is not part of any protest for that matter. So table it to the voting judge and ask the judges to see the evidence and call for a vote. Here, the majority votes should qualify to proceed to next step or the majority can also say squash it. It's not genuine. It doesn't liable for the protest. So the protest is killed then and there. If majority votes, whatever, whichever they vote, either to squash or not to, or to take it for, forward, the contestant is privately and uh, very discreetly called into and asked and, been, and will be briefed that we receive such a protest. So we'll give an opportunity for contestant to defend himself or herself because there are genuineness. I'll come to case studies where this has happened. So contestant will defend and after the contestant may leave the room, again, there's no cross-examination. Please be sensible, as I said. 
we only hear from the contestant what he says. We are not going to ask him anything, no question, no cross-examination, nothing, period. We all just keep quiet, listen to the contestant, the time he takes. Fairly a five to 10, five minutes we can give. After contestant makes his point, he will leave or she will leave. And then again, there'll be one more voting. Now the voting is to disqualify the contestant or to qualify. So again, the majority, majority mean, let's say we have four judges, for it matter, six judges, right? It's division of three. At least the four, I mean, uh, four judges should vote for or against whatever it is. The majority is majority. No equal and no tie breaking here. Chief judge doesn't take part in tie breaking or take part in disqualifying anything. He only facilitates everything. Let's be very clear about that. And after the majority votes, the outcome is communicated to the contestant discreetly and privately. If the outcome is not to disqualify, to qualify, nothing happens, the matter is closed and the contest result will be announced as usual, as the it has been tallied, right? If there's a disqualification, then it will be dropped. If he is in one of the three ranking, the next ranking person will take his place or her place. Now on the eligibility form, um, the chief judge has to collect the contestant eligibility form as I mentioned already and collect the eligibility form from the judges as well and verify no conflict of interest uh, happens. If there is any conflict of interest, the chief judge will have a word with that judge uh, himself in private. Now that's about it. We go to case study. Uh, do we take question as a, is there someone has a very pertinent question with the protest? I can take it now or we can park it for the end. We, I have five case studies, I'll go quickly. Uh, or you would like to ask, is there any questions moderator we have received so far? Moderator, have you received any questions so far? Yes, we have received few questions which we will uh, ask at the end of the session. Okay, fine. It's not regarding the protest. It's on the protest. I can take the question now because it's hot, right? Uh, so it's not for the protest. It is not like for protest. Okay, fine. Then for protest questions, yes, it can come later. Now, sure. case study number one. Okay, this is something interesting which happened in person at uh, DTAC in Abu Dhabi to be. And here I need answers. So since we are all the experienced judges here, a contest starts without a chief judge in the hall. What would you do as a chief judge? Answers, please. Or can a contest start with the chief judge? If it happens, what would be the case? What will you do? Stop the share. Yes, anyone? I think subject is very boring, isn't it? Chief judges. Okay. Yes, I did him, Surya. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shyam. Uh, the session is wonderful. Uh, regarding this point, we keep we're seeing this uh, happening in our online contest because when one contest gets over and the chief judge is responsible for two contests, the chief judge immediately moves into the ballot room after the first contest. But the contest chair and the MC, they are in a hurry to start the second contest. So they go ahead without the chief judge. Mm -hmm. So if right. that is a, such, a, such a thing happens, I think the chief judge should intervene or uh, better is to be uh, what do you call, proactive and inform them that uh, they should proceed only when the chief judge is back. Or if the chief judge feels the contest is a restart, but I think that it's a very tough call. So better to be forewarned rather than get into trouble. Thank you, Dijam Surya. I think that's a very valid point. This is this happening um, time and again because an online format. That's why we say we can prevent this easily by not engaging the same chief judge for two follow-on contests. That's one uh, point where you can uh, the contest manager can look into. Don't have the same chief judge for two contests follow-on if you don't have gap. Else, if you want the same chief judge for two contests, it's fair that you have to give sufficient time for the chief judge to tally the result because that is very very important for the chief judge. One of his main primary duty, right? So, and Abu Dhabi just, uh, and, uh, I think uh, dear Manzo would know that it was a table topic contest. The contest started, the chief judge outside and he's banging the door. Sergeant Dams uh, opens the door and he says, I'm the chief judge, I have to be in. He say, and Sergeant Dams a new person, right? He said, you can be king of swine, but I'm not going to let in. This is my duty, I want. So he pushed him out, right? 
so he was not let into and the contest started almost two speakers done and third they break they came in back in and said stop the contest and rerun the whole contest and it happened in dtac in physical so yes chief judge uh, has to be in the contest when the contest is starting it's very important and contest cannot run without chief judge as i said chief judge has to monitor the contest full and foremost thank you it may sound funny uh, now but that day it was quite a you know a tough thing for whole contest to start again because the contestants have to go through that experience again so let's be sensible to contestants case study number 2 protest on originality there was a case where a originality case has been lodged by one of the judge saying the speech uh, plagiarism has happened because this speech they exactly lifted from a newspaper column which he or she read okay uh, in one of the sunday times so the protest so happened and then the contestant was called in to defend himself all that procedure happened the first procedure is to qualify the genius is they saw the new sham you are muted sham okay i'm i'm muting myself so they, the chief judge checked the genuineness is it genuine it appeared in a column in a newspaper the whole speech is about that uh, uh, i mean speech and then the voting judges everybody voted yes this is correct he has lifted the speech when the contestant came in you know what happened the column author was the contestant it was a column uh, it was a contestant's uh, column who he himself authored and he gave it a speech so obviously don't jump into conclusion why take this case study is if we have been at rush or chief judge is a rush and judges are rush everybody think yes it's been lifted that's true it's been lifted but always hear the contestant's sake so here then the decision has turned around upside down obviously everybody voted to be qualified and the contest went on and he became a winner also in fact he's a first place winner so be sensible to the situation case number 3 i'll just go quickly now it's a red light yeah this has happened in our district uh, contestant joining from two device that's uh, very sensitive especially for a table topics and evaluation because the one device will be in breakout room one device will be in the hall if that's found out the contestant has lost the opportunity to compete as well in fact what happened the one contest since they saw two device charging terms host immediately moved one device which had audio into the breakout room the video device was banned the video cannot be even entered so contestant was disqualified this would happen this can be prevented if the contest chair had uh, briefed the contest chair and the contest chair briefed the contestants not to join with two devices it's always one device yeah so and don't start the contest again the contest also starts uh, starts in rush and you can't do anything about that one so that's one of the preventive measure, measures and case number four is pronunciation of a table topic contest again this happened at the end of the contest it came to know the pronunciation was not right uh, so the contest had to be rerun so probably chief judge could be uh, uh, could also take uh, timely decisions again here i would say chief judge is empowered have the uh, full fledged uh, responsibility as well as freedom to take the decision on his or her own if you feel the contest is not happening fairly again fairness doesn't mean that only eligibility originality sake fairness also happens that it's a level playing field for all the contestants to have the equal opportunity if you feel any point of time this not happening you have the rights to interject stop and restart the contest if it may so required last one as i said is one of the preventive measures is to discuss with the contest chair very important contest chair and chief judge you have to be hand in glove case both cannot give different briefing for different people that means one contestant would have a different briefing and judges would have different briefing and role plays so this is one of the most best preventive measures i think with the time i went it up uh, so we have seen who can be why we need one and what it takes to be chief judge what he or she has to do how to be a good and uh, effective chief judge and that's our in the summary i would say okay i have one summary quickly i'll just go through that oops have the rule book handy that's important and uh, have elaborate uh, briefing elaborate briefing i mean prior to the contest and during the contest brief the judges and role players and also the contest chair as i said be vigilant all times and enjoy the contest and experience the outcome so thank you so much for the opportunity now i'm happy to take the questions
So I don't want to delay the world champion of public speaking champion. You know, yeah. next so, we'll start. Thank you. Can we all have a virtual round of applause, please, for Toastmaster Sham? Thank you very much for that session. It was enlightening and uh, it, it was enlightening actually for me. There's a lot of the stuff I knew nothing about, so it was very useful in that sense. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for the question and answer session. Uh, it will be hosted by Toastmaster Bindu Unikrishnan. Just a correction, she will be the question and answer session host for both sessions today, okay? She's an MBA graduate from the Netherlands. She studied human resource management in IAM Calcutta and is currently working in a multinational company as an HR director. She decided to be a Toastmaster during the pandemic and has enjoyed every aspect of it since. She's the president of Al Sawaya Toastmasters and the VP Education of Elite Toastmasters Club. Please join me to welcome our question and answer session host, Toastmaster Bindu. Thank you, Master of Ceremony, for a wonderful introduction. I acknowledge the presence of all eminent leaders, distinguished guests, and fellow Toastmasters. A warm good evening to one and all present over here. Thank you so much, trainer Shyam Sundar, for your brilliant, crisp, and insightful training session. Not only the session was informative, but the training was really interesting, especially with the real contest experience provided us an entrailing experience. Definitely, all of us would be benefited from it. As this is a timed session, so dear Toastmaster Shamsundar, shall we proceed directly with the question answer session? You cannot hear me? Thank you, unmuting. Yeah, yeah, no, I got unmuted, yeah. Yes, uh, Tosma Bindu, please, let's go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. The first question for tonight is from DTM Surya Narayan. He says that in terms of who the chief judge should ensure that he or she has no conflict of interest of any kind with any contest. Sometimes it may be known. Sometimes the chief judge need to act with integrity. Yeah, that's a brilliant question coming from um, yeah, brilliant Toastmasters. So this is uh, quite subjective. For the matter, the chief, uh, the rule book does really does not talk about this one. But however, as a chief judge, it's in my interest to have again, as I say, the level playing fairness of the contest. Would I would ask the judges if, in case if he has any conflict of interest with any one of the contestants, he may choose to step down. Or I would also, in my power, I would not take that judge into the judging panel if I am get to know. If I uh, get to know timely that this judge might have a conflict of interest, I would not choose it. Uh, choose that judge uh, for the fairness of the contest. It's nothing personal. I don't have anything with the judge. But again, I own the responsibility as a chief judge. I'm, I'm, when I say I, I mean I'm me being the chief judge. I own the responsibility for the contest to be fair and square. So yes, I would not uh, take the judge into the judging panel. If required, I will also let the judge know why I'm not taking him. But then that, that's my prerogative as a chief judge. Uh, Didam Surya, did I answer that uh, question? Oh, thank you. Again, these are unwritten rules, by the way. Let me underline that. Thank you, Dr. Smash for that. Uh, let's move on to the next question. It is from Toastmaster Gilda, who says that how we can secure internet connectivity? Can we have our phone in this time? Can we use our phone as hotspot? Could you please explain? Yeah, um, thank you. It's a technical question, nice one. In fact, to be honest, I lost my internet connect uh, connectivity. I don't know whether how many people have noted that. That's before my speech. Then I had to take, not my hotspot, I have my Wi-Fi device as well. So I connected with that one. So that's a fallback mass, uh, mass, uh, mechanism. But again, it also depends on what role you're playing. If you're a contestant, yes, I would strongly recommend let's have a wire, wire connection, wired LAN connection, because that is more stable. The Wi-Fi is always, you know, uh, can give in. So for that, obviously not all the laptops have the LAN connection. You have, can have a dongle and have the wired connection. I think that's what Toastmaster Nisha also did that when she was uh, doing her regional quarterfinals. Toastmaster Nisha, you can watch for that, right? The LAN connection, the wire, yes. 
it's better to have that one or the ho uh, mobile hotspot i would not recommend because mobile hotspot again depends on your ios or android so mobile hotspot uh, no i don't recommend the mobile hotspot but have the hotspot that wi-fi device you have a separate device 4g or 5g that's something which you can have yep next interesting question is from toastmaster nehar he says that if a contestant show up late for his order in contest is he disqualified I think we need to refine that question. When when the contest uh, chair takes on to stage to announce the result, uh, announce the speaking mm -hmm. order, it doesn't mean the speaking order. He, as long as the contest chair comes on to stage, that means the contest has started. He doesn't say the let's begin the contest. No, not for that word. The moment he or she takes on the uh, stage, the contest is supposed to be in the room. And in case the contestant doesn't show up when his name is called, he's automatically disqualified. Yes, he, he will lose. I won't say disqualify. I'm sorry about that one. I'll excuse the word. That's not the right word. The right word is he or she will lose the opportunity to take part in the contest. That's the right word. But that's really unfortunate. Having prepared so much, uh, putting up so much effort, I would really encourage the contestant to not to lose the opportunity uh, with this reason. That would be very, very sad for everyone. Yeah. I can understand. Window. Now, the next question is raised by uh, DTM Suryal Kumar Menon. He says that in a table topic contest, when there is a case of mispronunciation, what is the timely action a chief judge can take after the topic has been read to the first contestant? Over to you. Yeah, brilliant. Nice question. Yes. Uh, the chief judge should be, as I said, very much vigilant. If he or she feels the topic is not being pronounced rightly, again, the question comes, how would the chief judge know the topic? Because the topic has been selected by the contest chair, right? If he or feel, again, is subjective, chief judge can check the topic with the contest chair. Again, I'm not the right person or authority to say that because it, it's not written in the rule book again, because the, the contest topic is, again, the prerogative of the contest chair to keep it secret. In case a chief judge feels a topic is being read or mispronounced, or he or she is not able to get it right, the con chief judge has the rights and responsibility as well to pause, stop, and repeat the contest with a new topic. So in this matter, the chief judge should also ask the contest chair to come prepared with at least two or three topics. Again, not to have the practice of giving three choice under two contest chair. It will be only one topic the chief judge will, uh, contest chair will choose to read but the contest chair should have two or three topics prepared. In case such eventuality, unfortunate sequence happens, the chief judge will stop the contest and repeat it. And it will be much better if it's done with the first contestant so that no one is being victimized. Yes, Tosmi. Uh, if I'm not answering the question, or if you're not satisfied with the answer, I'll be happy to repeat it or I can take a follow-on question also from the one who asked the question. If you're not satisfied or you want more details that definitely the person who has raised the question they have to answer it so it would be better that they can send the details across to you through email and correspond further on to that so yeah we'll go over the time we can do that one yes i agree with you toastmaster bindu yes please yeah uh toastmaster shamsundar the next question is raised by new muhammad mm -hmm. he says that transparency question should the judge submit the whole ballot sheet and not just the winners? This can be submitted to chief judge only and can be retained until the winners are announced. This can be helpful in evaluating the extreme bias rather than blindly trusting that judge are operating with integrity. This is a recommendation as well as the question. So. Yeah, I would take uh, both. Yeah, I will. I will answer that. Uh, as a chief judge, I should not or need not know how you are. Uh, you have ranked as a judge, right? As a judge, we trust your integrity. We respect your fairness, and we. You need to uh, send us only the bottom sheet of the paper. The, to the chief judge, you send only the bottom sheet. Pick your winners. I said you are not going to evaluate, right? You don't need to see the scoring because your scoring could be different from other judges' scoring. Obviously, you'll have your own benchmarks. But whatever it is, do everything to yourself. And there is no bias. We trust your judgment. And that's how the chief judge trusts his or her panel. Because again, the chief judge will own the responsibility because he or she has a responsibility of selecting the judges. Selecting means choosing them. 
and keeping them in the panel. So yes, as a judge, as chief judge, I will strongly discourage, or I would, I, I would say don't, please don't send the full balance sheet, send only the bottom part of the balance sheet, sign it and break the tie and send it, period. Uh, we are already almost hitting the time. So before we wrap up, let me ask quickly one anonymous Any question. questions more? So anything interesting or anything? Okay, I'll leave it anonymous to you. Anonymous is one small question. That is, can a chief judge for club contest be a contestant at club level? Can a chief judge at a club contest? Yes. For a club okay. contest, the be a contestant says, at club level. Yeah, at club level, it's perfectly fine. No issues. Because the rule book says beyond club level, you can't take but in that category of the contest, if it's table topics, you can't be contestants as well as voting judge, tiebreak judge, uh, contest role player, or the chief judge for that matter. No, beyond club, only this would apply in club level. Yes, you can, but not in the same uh, club uh, contest, by the way. The same table topic contest and club contest, you can't be chief judge and taking part in the contest also. That will be heights of, uh, you know, conflict. Yes. I think we are already on the red zone. So I will just wind up this session. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, thank you everyone for participating in this question answer session. We know that there are few questions that are unanswered. So please send your questions directly to Toastmaster Shang's email ID or WhatsApp. Thank you so much, uh, Toastmaster Shang Sundar, for your explicit and thoughtful answer. So thank you. as thank a result you. of this training session, I'm also sure as our district director is sure that many members will step in as chief judge for the upcoming contest. Thank you for now and over to master of ceremony. The screen is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much Bindu for facilitating what was a very productive question and answer session. Now, I don't think I need to get you all excited for the trainer of the next session because I think we all feel the same way. It I highly anticipate what's what's coming next, but I would like to talk about her a little bit so we can get to know her a little more before we hear what she has to say in the session. Verity is the first speaker from Africa to ever be crowned the world champion of public speaking and the sixth woman in history. So way to go, Verity. She has a talent for not only thinking out of the box, but also acting out of the box, as those of you who saw her speech, which I'm sure we all have, would also know this as well. This has enabled her to speak globally about innovation and also about thinking differently, including two TEDx talks, and this has helped drive her international success. She has a degree in psychology and anthropology and is an accredited De Bono Six Thinking Hats facilitator and an advocate for positive psychology. Her winning speech in the 2021 contest entitled A Great Read captured the minds of the judges and of the audience. It was written to inspire the audience to make positive changes and improve their lives by, how she called it, writing a different story. And writing a different story is exactly what she helps people do through crafting speeches and delivering highly successful workshops for clients and businesses alike. I loved her speech in this year's contest. It strongly resonated with me, and I've no doubt it did the same for a huge number of you here today. So please join me in welcoming to the screen she who is here to help us write some winning speeches. This year, world champion of public speaking, Verity Price. Thank you so much. What a what a warm welcome and so lovely to be with you, District 116. I'm thrilled to be here. And I must say, sitting in on a bit of that last workshop, I relived all the nerves of the contest and all the possible things that could go wrong. And what if we get disqualified? And what if we lose internet? So I'm so glad that there's these amazing workshops happening to just prepare everyone, especially when we are competing virtually. So it really is my privilege and my pleasure to be with you today and to share with you the journey that I have just been on that has been life changing and to hopefully show you how you can write a winning story, not only in your Toastmasters journey, but also in your own life. So what I'm going to say to you is pick up your pen, take notes of the things that I say that maybe resonate for you, that you think you can apply 
to your own Toastmasters career. And I hope that at the end of our time together, you will have some tips and tricks to write your own winning story. So talking about winning, can I just see, and I'm very happy to use the chat. I like this to be an interactive process. So if you could maybe tell me, do you like winning? Who here likes winning? You can just give me a yes if you're quite keen on the idea of winning. You can give me thumbs up, you know, and this can be winning a raffle, a car, the lottery, the Toastmasters International Speech Contest. Oh, yes, very much. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, good. So we all like winning, which is probably why we're at uh, a session like this today, because this is all about how do we make the most of contests. So there's a story of a man who loved winning. But the thing he wanted to win most was the lottery. And so every Saturday night when the lottery numbers were being drawn, he would sit in front of his TV and he would watch those numbers come up and he wouldn't win. So the next Saturday he would tune in and he would watch the numbers being drawn and he wouldn't win. This went on for months. And eventually one night in utter frustration, he looked up at the sky and he said, why, why do I never win? And a voice came down from above and said, you might want to buy a ticket. So ladies and gentlemen, in March this year, I bought my ticket. I entered the Toastmasters International Speech Contest and I went on a roller coaster journey that resulted in me winning the proverbial Toastmasters lottery. When I heard those words on the 28th of August, and the winner is, and my name were the next two words that came out of the contest chair's mouth, I was blown away. But it's not a journey that was guaranteed, and it's not a journey I ever anticipated I would go on. Because the first time I ever entered the speech contest was way back in 2012 when I was a new Toastmaster. And I didn't really understand much about the organization. And someone in the club said, we're having a contest. So I said, oh, I'll enter. And the attitude I had was, I'm pretty good at Toastmasters. I'm good at speaking. This will be easy for me. My sister was also a member of our club and she decided to enter as well. But her attitude was, this is new to me. I've never done this before. I'm going to use this to grow and learn. And so we went into the contest with very different mindsets and very different attitudes. I wrote my speech the day before. I practiced it three times and I arrived at the contest ready to win. Kay wrote her speech a month before. She rewrote it. She revised it. She rehearsed it. In fact, I'd watch her walking around the lounge practicing it and I felt sorry for her. I was like, shame, she's such a nerd. And with that attitude, we walked into our contest. And the last thing I ever expected to hear was in second place, Verity Price. My sister beat me. She'd only done six speeches in her Toastmasters journey. She was terrified of speaking and she beat me. And I was mortified. I was even more mortified when I discovered that we hadn't been doing a pub contest, we'd entered something called the International Speech Contest. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a world champion of public speaking, and I had messed up my chances. I'm embarrassed to tell you, I sat at the back of the area contest, convinced the judges would see that she didn't know what she was doing. And I had to smack a smile on my face when they said, and the winner is Kay Price Lindsay. Everyone was saying to me, your sister's so good. And I was like, yeah, she's great. And then I sat at the division contest thinking she'll lose this one. I don't want her to win. She'll lose. Let someone else go through. And I heard once again, and the winner is Kay Price Lindsay. I had jealousy that was starting to bubble up inside of me. This was not my finest moment. I was absolutely horrified that she was shining bright and I had missed out on the opportunity. And let me tell you, when people say, you know, that you're green with envy, it's actually because it makes you ill. I started getting depressed. I was feeling sorry for myself. And one day out of the blue, Kay phoned me up. She said, V, I'm worried about you. You haven't seen yourself lately. Why don't you come over for a cup of tea and we can chat? I was so ashamed. And I knew that I actually had to tell her what had been going on. So I got in my car 
and I drove to her. I was trembling with the honesty that I needed to share with her. And I sat in her garden holding my cup of tea and I said, Kay, I've been so angry that you won. I've been hoping that you would lose. And you know what she said? Thanks for sharing, Lee. This must have been hard for you. And everything changed. I suddenly could see the energy, the intention, the enthusiasm she'd been putting in. And I got on board as one of her coaches and one of her mentors. And a few weeks later, we waited with bated breath to hear who the district winner was. And it was Kay. And now started the three month marathon of getting prepared to go to the world semifinals. And that was when I realized the effort that goes into this contest, the obstacles the speaker has to come over, the challenges they face, all the feedback they have to deal with, and that your success comes from leaning into and learning from the success of previous champions. And Kay did all of it. And when we waved her off to fly to Orlando, Florida that year, we all knew that she really stood a great chance. And everyone from my club came to my house and we managed to get it live streaming and we watched and we waited with bated breath. And for the first time in six months, we heard, and in second place, Kay Price Lindsay. She was beaten by a young man by the name of Ryan Avery. You might've heard of him because two days later, he became the world champion. So we still believe if she'd been in a different semi-final, maybe she would have met him at the final stage, but we will never know. But Kay showed me what a champion mindset looks like. I went in with a mindset of being pretty lazy and pretty arrogant. And to be honest, that's never going to take you anywhere in a contest. She went in with a mindset to open, to grow, to learn. And that's what she did. She came back a better speaker and a better person as a result of buying her ticket. Now, you'd think after seeing all of that, I would have signed up the next year, bought my ticket and entered again. I was like, are you crazy? You've seen how hard that is? I don't have time to that. I don't have speeches that are good enough. I'll never make it. And I told myself that for years. And you can maybe nod if you've had that experience when it comes around to contest time and you go, nah, it's not going to happen for me. I entered once in 2015, I managed to get to division level, I came third, and then I waited six years until I entered again. And the only reason I entered was because in November last year, something shifted for me. I wrote a speech for a club meeting about a lesson my mom taught me to always leave the world better than I find it. And when I finished writing that speech, this little voice said, hmm, that's a contest speech. And I was like, hmm. Maybe it is. And then it said, and I think you could win. It's like, whoa, I could win the World Championship of Public Speaking. And right there was the choice. Do I let the voice that says I can't do it and I don't have the time and I don't have what it takes? Or do I listen to the voice that says maybe you can? And so I decided to listen to this voice. I bought my ticket in March. I set my sights on that trophy. I'm not going to lie to you. I 100% joined hoping that I would win. And then I gave it everything. And there were obstacles. And I heard people talking about those obstacles earlier in the, in the questions. Internet connectivity. We have electricity cuts in South Africa. I had an 18-month-old baby on the other side of the door. I was trying to compete from my bedroom. But I knew if I wanted to see where this contest was going to take me, I had to embrace those obstacles. Then there was the challenge, the challenge of, okay, you've written a speech that maybe gets you to win district. What's your speech for the finals going to be if you get that far? And I mean, have you ever struggled to find a speech and find something to write about when it comes to contests? I can see some people nodding their heads. I think that's the biggest challenge as Toastmasters. I wrote four different speeches before I landed on a great read. I spent hours working on those speeches, but I had committed to taking on that challenge to find a story or a moment in my life that I believed could make a difference for my audience. And then there was the effort that I needed to put in. As I said, I had a small baby on one side of the door. I was trying to run a business virtually, but I knew that if I put this down to hoping I would find the time, it was never going to happen. You can't find time to do something important. You have to make the time to do something important. And so I made the commitment to make the time to give these speeches everything I could. 
By the time I'd heard I was through to the semi-finals, with the help of my district, we managed to book me in to speak at 42 clubs in 16 countries across five continents. I was sometimes speaking at four clubs a day. It was exhausting. But I knew that I didn't want to get to the end of this journey and regret that I hadn't given it my all. And when you speak at 42 clubs around the world, let me tell you what you have to make friends with. You need to become first name friends with feedback. The feedback I received was extraordinary. It was helpful, but it was super confronting. More than 200 Toastmasters weighed in on what I should be doing differently with my speeches, what they were expecting from me, what they didn't like. And it was amazing to get all that feedback, but it was extraordinarily confronting. I had to deal with my ego that wanted to believe that the speech I'd written was perfect and what did they know? And then I had to have a bit of a conversation with my ego that actually Verity, your speech is not for you. Speech is for your audience. And if they're asking for changes, you should listen. And it was a humbling and incredible experience to realize how much feedback can grow us as people and as speakers. And the last thing I did that was one of the fundamental changes for me was that I leant into and I decided to learn from the success of others. The beautiful thing about this contest is you don't enter it in a void. There are 80 other world champions that have done this journey. Their videos are online. You can watch them. You can learn from them. You can see those common threads and see how to apply it to yourself and to your unique style and your unique voice. And so that's what I did. And that's when I decided I needed to reach out to one of them to work with the best. I reached out to my favorite world champ of all time, the 2005 champion Lance Miller, and he said yes to being my coach. And he walked this journey with me. The last three months were incredible. He held me to a high standard. He pushed my speeches into uncomfortable places that made me question what I was doing so that I could stretch myself. But he also held my insecurities. He let me talk about what was scaring me and what I was struggling with. And he shared his journey so that I could know I wasn't the first person to ever do this. And through embracing what I call a champion mindset and going on this journey full heartedly and with complete and utter commitment, I was lucky, I would say, and extraordinarily grateful to hear that I had won, that actually I'd managed to bring this incredible trophy back to Africa for the first time. But unlike the lottery, this is not just luck. If you've entered a contest, you'll know just how much hard work goes into it. It's deliberate determination. And so when you bring that mindset from the club level all the way through, it makes a huge difference. I just want to share with you something I've been chatting to previous winners and previous finalists to see, are there any links? Did people have a similar experience to the one I did all the way to the finals? And there are, there's a lot of similarities. So here's a really interesting thing. The majority of finalists start writing their speech three months before the contest. They don't wait a week before, they start writing it three months. Some of them start the minute the world champion is announced, they start preparing. So have you started writing your speech is my first question. Over 60% of them work with a coach or a mentor and more than 35% of them pay for that mentorship. I paid for the mentorship. I knew that I needed to work with the best, so I invested in my dream and I decided to pay for it. 66% of finalists speak at more than 40 clubs in their lead up to getting to the finals. And they deliver their speech more than 200 times and write over 30 versions. So be ready to write and rewrite your speech. Because what I've learned is great speeches aren't written. They are rewritten. And the magic is in the editing. They all asked for feedback. They all applied that feedback. And in the last two months, they spent an average of one to two hours a day working on their speeches. I was at about four hours a day. It took up all my time. And in fact, let me tell you a little something about inspiration. Inspiration is incredibly inconsiderate. 
Well, maybe yours isn't, but mine loves to wake me up at three in the morning with the perfect new sentence to add to my speech. And it won't let me go back to sleep until I've woken up, opened my laptop and stopped typing. So most of my speeches happened in the middle of the night and I just had to make peace with that. This journey is a life changing journey, regardless of whether you win a trophy or not. And as I said, unlike the lottery, it's not a game of luck, it's a game of hard work. And if you buy your ticket by entering the contest in the next few months, only one, one of us, we don't know who, but one Toastmaster out there right now is guaranteed to become the world champion. Everyone else is guaranteed to grow. And that is the gift that this contest gives us. When we buy the ticket, when we step up and say, I wanna use a contest to improve my speaking skills and become a better speaker, that is the gift it gives us. It gives us the gift of growth. You can buy a trophy anywhere, to be honest. I mean, it's lovely to get it, but the win is in working on a speech that excites you and sharing it in your unique way and getting the growth that comes with that. So that is the gift. And do you want to buy your ticket? Who, who here is going to buy their ticket for the for the international speech contest, I see a yes, someone saying me. Or have I scared you off? Does it sound like too much work? <laughs> I think you all know it's a lot of hard work. There is no shortcut in a contest. And me, I love that, Carla. <laughs> you have to think of this contest as the Olympics of speaking. And if you can approach your speech the way an athlete approaches their sport, you will get the most out of this journey. And uh, I don't have the resources to buy the ticket. We all have the resources to buy the ticket. We just have to put our name in the hat. And if we can get an internet connection, we can. Okay. So talking about gifts and the gift we get of growth that comes through this, I'm assuming all of you enjoy receiving gifts. We know you all like winning. Do you like getting stuff? Do you like it if people give you gifts? I see people saying yes. I see people nodding. Yes, yes, yes. Goody. I'm actually just going to pop something in the chat now. My One of my gifts to you today is if you sign up to my newsletter, you will get a little free booklet on how to write a winning speech. So at any point during the session, sign up. And there's actually a bonus gift in there that we'll, uh, you'll find out a little bit more about later. I love gifts. I'm a big gift giver. It's one of my love languages. And growing up as a little girl, my favorite day of the year was Christmas because that is gifts galore. And my favorite thing was to come downstairs on Christmas morning and just gasp as I looked at the piles of presents packed under the tree. I couldn't wait to unwrap them. As I grew up, that love of unwrapping gifts and giving gifts didn't change. And it's always been a big thing in our family. But a few years ago, we decided to do things a little differently. And I came down on Christmas morning and there was not one present under the tree. And I felt disappointed. It felt wrong. I was like, mm. but there was another part of me that was feeling a bit excited because we were doing things differently. And over the next hour or so, family and friends started arriving to celebrate together. And each person was carrying a solitary gift that was sensationally wrapped. They looked incredible. And they all got put down under the tree and everyone was looking at them with anticipation and curiosity. Because what we decided to do was rather than waste money at the busy shops buying gifts that people probably didn't need, we were each gonna wrap one present that contained a white elephant. Now, I just need to check. Do you know what a white elephant is? Does everyone know what a white elephant is? Have you heard of this before? It's not an animal. <laughs> Although I would love to see, I see some people putting their hands up. For those of you who don't know, a white elephant is something you own, but you never use. It sits at the back of a cupboard or on top of a shelf. It's gathering dust. You don't even know why you have it anymore. And so for fun, we decided each person would wrap a white elephant amazingly so that everyone else wanted it. And then we would just have un fun unwrapping it. Well, it was hysterical. People pulled at the bows. They got sticky tape stuck on their fingers. They ripped away the wrapping paper only to get an oversized coffee cup or a never before used cookbook. Or the funniest of the all was a huge rusted hamster cage. We had 
the time of our lives. And the thing that stood out for me was even though we were giving away things we didn't want anymore, the more fun someone had unwrapping it, the more they seemed to treasure what they found inside. My brother-in-law's bachelor friend got the cookbook and he was like, this is great. I can impress my dates. I got the oversized coffee cup and I looked at it and was like, well, I can put a pot plant in here. And my cousin, when she opened the hamster cage, she looked at this rusted hamster cage and then she looked at us and went, you won't believe this. Amy just said she wants a hamster. Well, we were finished. So now you're probably going, come on, Verity, we've come here to learn about writing speeches. Why are you telling us about your crazy Christmases? I will tell you why. In the 10 years that I have been a Toastmaster and in the seven months it took me to win the World Championship of Public Speaking, I've had one very big realization. And that is a great speech is a gift that you give to your audience. I want you to think about that. A great speech is a gift that you give to your audience. And the ultimate gift inside is the message that they take home and they start using. But the wrapping is the story and the speech craft that you deliver it to them. Now, you always have a choice in how you wrap a great gift. And what's beautiful is you might have experiences in your life, moments or memories that feel like a white elephant, something that happened long ago, you've forgotten about it, it doesn't feel that important. But when you're looking for content for a contest, you might suddenly remember that funny thing that happened in a supermarket, like running into a friend who was doing well when you weren't doing well. You might remember that from my speech. That was a long forgotten experience that I dusted off and wrapped and put gave to my audience. So you look through your life for white elephant moments and then you wrap it so that the audience wants to uncover it with you and discover what the gift is inside. But this is where your choice comes in. Because when you're giving someone a gift, you could give it to them like that. So here you go, I've got you a gift. I've put it in this plain brown bag, enjoy. But I think you'll agree that's not very inspiring. If you're really boring, you could do this and just let them know from the outset exactly what you're giving them. Now, I do this because sometimes as Toastmasters, without meaning to, this is what we do. From as early as our title, we've already told the audience what we're going to tell them. Or in the first few lines, we've already given them the whole point. And then they're like, well, I don't know if I feel like a book. Why, why are you telling me? So don't do this. You might choose to do this, but as you can see, it's not very inspiring. Or you could give them a gift that looks like this. Entice them, draw them in, create some curiosity that they start shaking it, wondering what's inside, prepared to go on the journey of unwrapping it with you and discovering what's there. So my question to you, and you can just put this in the chat, which would you prefer, the bag or the box? If I was giving you gifts right now, which one do you want, the bag or the box? Box, 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 box. <laughs> I do love that we can put so much energy <laughs> into just a few words. Some people want the bag, but I think most of us want the box. This is where you create intrigue and interest. Okay, beautiful. So let's look at how this applies to writing a winning speech. Because if a speech is a gift you give the audience, how do we create that gift? And what I've done based on my experience over the last eight months is taken this word gift and said, how could we create four steps to writing a winning speech? And the first step is with the G, which for me stands for get clear on your message. The most important part of a contest speech is the message. It needs to be unique. It needs to be original. I know we were speaking about originality earlier, and it needs to grab the audience and have them want to commit to that message and take it into their hearts and do something with it. So this is the hardest step of a speech, but it is the most important. Now, your first message statement might not be your best one, and I know that because when I wrote a great read, I had four different message statements before I landed on write a different story. That only came 10 days before the contest. The story and the speech had stayed pretty much the same, but I'd started with happiness as a choice, 
A lot of the men in the audience didn't like that for some reason. Then I changed it to look for the good and people said, mm, that just sounds a bit cheesy. Then I had changed the way you look at things, which was based on a Wayne Dyer quote. And someone pointed out that might lose points on originality. And finally, I got to my statement of write a different story. What you want your message statement to be is a call to action. It needs to give the audience an action that they can take. And if you look at previous winners over the years, you'll see that's what they give us. Words have power. Reach out. The victory is in the try. Do you validate? If you listen to it, these are really easy, simple little sentences that you can repeat after having heard the speech. So here's the trick. If you can't say your sentence, uh, your message in a sentence, you're not going to be able to say it in an hour. That's by Diane Boyer. And I love that. Work on getting your message down into a simple sentence or phrase and then structure your whole story around that so that that message gets delivered over and over again. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the 2013 world champion Prez Vazilev. And I, in my lead up and, and all the work I did during the contest, I bought his compelling storytelling course, which I can highly recommend. And there he shared a trick that once you have your message statements, once you've gotten clear on your message, you need to try and repeat it through your speech as many times as you can, but in different ways. So if you watch my winning speech, you'll see I implemented that technique of his. The first time I say my message statement, I'm reading a letter from my dad. And so my dad's voice gives the message. Your life is a book. If you're not enjoying the read, write a different story. A second later, I go, come on, dad, how can I write a different story? So I've said the message again, but I'm resisting what my dad has said. Then I go to Facebook and I make a comment on everyone else's stories are much happier. And then the letter looks at me and it says, write a different story. Now, this was a technique I learned from Prez. And if you watch his winning speech, you'll see how he says reach out, I think 14 times in his speech. But it never feels like repetition because he does it in dialogue and he does it in different ways. So find ways to repeat that message so that the audience slowly goes on that journey of going, OK, this is what we're doing. This is what the call to action is. So once you've gotten clear on your message, your next step is to intentionally structure the story around it. Because the story is the wrapping. The story is the shape. That's what draws people towards you. And there are so many techniques for writing great stories. But the simple one is to take people on a hero's journey. So the first thing you want to do is set your story up very clearly right at the start of your speech. If you remember my speech, I was on my dad's knee hearing about fairy tales. And that instantly let me show you why I was disappointed at 40 that my life didn't look the way I expected and I was in a spare room. It took about 30 seconds to set up the story. So now you've created your setting of where and when the story is happening. Now you have to introduce who the hero is. And often we are the hero because we're telling a story that's happened to us. And we need to let the audience know what obstacle, what problem are you dealing with that you're trying to resolve? And I was like, I'm single, I don't have children, my life's going nowhere. And then I run into a friend whose life is perfect. So you want to create a bit of tension for the audience. You want them to feel like, oh dear, I hope you, I hope you sort this out. And you draw them in by creating a little bit of attention. And that for me is like the sticky tape that you're trying to pull off without ripping the paper. You want them to feel the anticipation of how is this going to resolve? And that's the point that you introduce a mentor or a guru who's going to help you resolve your problem. Now, you always want the message and the truth that you are sharing through your, your speech to come from someone or something else, not from you. It needs to be an experience or a person who taught you a lesson that you're sharing with the audience rather than you lecturing the audience on how they should change, especially seeing they don't know you and uh, people don't like being told what to do. It's much easier for them to live your story with you, feel your humiliation or the thing you were struggling with, and then learn the lesson that you learned by listening to how it changed you. So my dad was my mentor and the letter was how the message was delivered. And then I created tension on resisting the message. And that was, come on, dad, I can't do this. Look at Facebook. And I didn't want to change. And it's very important that you show resistance to change because 
I'm, I'm sure whenever you've decided that you want to change something in your life and you go, this is it, I'm going to turn over a new leaf, it's still hard. You still stop. You don't get it right. And audiences will trust that change takes time. In my early versions of the speech, I changed far too quickly. I read my dad's letter and I instantly got grateful. And the feedback from the audience was, oh, really? You were really depressed and you were really stuck. And then everything turned around. So that's where I realized it is so important that your story continues to take your audience on a journey. So show that resistance to change and then show how you reflect and realize actually I do need to change. And my reflection point was remembering all the times my father had written a different story and then using the awareness that brought me to suddenly look at my life differently. So it was constantly about showing the obstacle, the message, and how I resolved it. When you write a story like that, it doesn't have to be very complicated. In fact, you want to keep your story as simple as possible with as few elements as possible so that your audience can easily follow it. It just means it's a delightful experience for them to unwrap the message that is lying right in the center of that story. And that then brings us to the third thing, the F of gift which is to fill in the gaps that your audience has. Until I entered this contest, it had never really occurred to me that when I was writing a speech, I should see if my audience had things they were confused by. And it was only when I started visiting clubs all around the world and giving them a Google form to give me feedback on that I realized there was a lot that the audience didn't necessarily understand in my speeches. And the reason for that is your story is something you've lived through. So when you write it and when you deliver it, you won't think of certain details that your audience might want. So if you don't ask them what's missing for them, how can you write a speech that they fully understand? And ultimately, when you're writing a contest speech, you're writing it for the judges. And you don't want for a second that the judges are going, I wonder, did she say that? Or what happened there? And I'm sure you've maybe had this experience listening to a speech before. You get stuck on something that maybe isn't clear and you, your mind goes in a new direction. So filling in the gaps for your audience is a critical part of writing a winning speech. And the only way you're going to do that is by making friends with feedback. And what I suggest is make sure that you are getting feedback from a diverse audience. I have a, a theory as to why no one has ever won the World Championship of Public Speaking from Southern Africa. We've got fantastic speakers here. We have sent so many to the semifinals with high hopes, but we've only ever once come second back in 2004, uh, Douglas Kruger came second. But other than that, we hardly ever got into the finals. And the only reason I believe that is, is because up until it went virtual, and this might be, the, I think this would be the same for every district, the district winners are practicing their speeches for their district. And so you're only getting your district's perspective on what works about your speech. In this virtual world, I was able to be speaking in Singapore, India, America, Switzerland, and I got diverse feedback of different cultures and different understanding. And that allowed me to write a speech that could kind of traverse different cultures. If I'd been speaking only to Toastmasters in Cape Town, I wouldn't have filled in all those gaps that an international audience had. So to give you some, some examples where I've changed things in my speech based on feedback, I was quite sad. I got, I got feedback from a woman in London saying, I loved your speech, but I'm in my 60s and this doesn't give me hope at all. You turned your life at round at 40, what about me? And at that point, I thought my speech was giving hope and I was like, oh, so I looked at what I'd written and I thought two small changes will fill in that gap. The one was to mention that my dad was actually 60 when he lost everything. And the other was to put in a simple line of it doesn't matter what chapter of your life you're in. So it was only through getting her feedback that I could start to change my speech. Someone else came back saying, I love all the changes and how your life moved, but you're not telling us how long it took. And if I want to change my life, how long can I expect that change to take? 
I was like, gosh, that's a good point. I'm so close to my story. I haven't thought that you need that information. So that's when I added in that I moved out of the spare room after six months. I met my husband after a year. I had a baby after four years. So if you don't ask your audience, you'll never know what the gaps are. So write for your audience. The gift is for them. And if you can fill in those gaps, you will write a much more comprehensive and easy to follow speech. And that is a huge step towards writing a winning speech. The final step, the T of gift, is you need to work out how to tie every single element of your speech together. You don't want to leave any loose ends when you finish speaking. So for me as a, as a speech writer, what I always do is when I'm getting to the conclusion of my speech, I look at the story I've written and I go, okay, we're coming to the end. How do I tie back to the beginning? And if you've watched the speech, you'll see I suddenly go, I've realized that fairy tales are great to read to my son, which was a reference back to the starting sentence of sitting on my dad's knee being read fairy tales. I then tied back to the letter to the audience saying, you know, if your life is a book, because that's what the letter had said, you need to decide if your story is being written for you or by you. I then tied back to when my dad reminded me that I was the author of my life, my life changed. And then back to the audience. So if you want to change, if you're looking for a miracle to something that had been mentioned in the letter, pick up your pen. It's something I'd said earlier in the speech and write a different story. And that was the message I'd been repeating throughout. And then right at the end, I said, trust me, it'll make for a great read, which was the tie all the way back to the title. So I'm always looking as a speaker for the opportunities to go, how do I tie up every single thing that I've mentioned in my speech so that when I'm finished, the audience feels like they've been given a complete gift. And now it's up to them whether they accept it or not. As a speaker, you cannot force someone to take your message. And in fact, if you listen to my speech again, you'll say, you'll hear I say, you get to choose if your story is being written for you or by you. I don't tell them they should choose. I just put it out there and I give them two options. And I know most people are going to go, hell, I want to write my story for me, which is what I was trying to say. But always make sure you're giving them the option to take it home. You're not telling them they have to. So those are the four steps that I really believe will help you craft a winning story. G get clear on your message. I intentionally structure your story so that it's compelling, it creates curiosity and connection with the audience, and it takes them on a journey, on your hero's journey of struggling to overcome something, finding a mentor or a guru, being given a way forward that you resist and finally accept and apply into your life, and then you give back that message right at the end. Make sure you fill in the gaps, any of the gaps that they have that they need in the story so that they're not left with questions when you finish speaking. And right at the end, tie it all together so that you've given them the gift. I really hope that's something that you can apply and that you can look at speeches you've written and go, how can I make this about my audience and not just about me? How can I ensure that the story I'm sharing, that white elephant experience that once happened to me, could actually become valuable to someone else and make sure it answers the needs they have and speaks to an audience universally. Because if you look at the great speeches that, especially in a Toastmasters context, their messages are universal. They're not necessarily earth shattering. They're simple little daily truths that all of us nod and go, yeah, yeah, you're right. I should do that. Or yes, that would make a difference. So this is your opportunity to look around your life Dust off experiences, moments, memories that maybe have a story that goes with them that will deliver a really powerful message to your audience. And once you know that you're up for that challenge and you go, you know what, I'm going to put in the effort that is required. I'm going to make friends with feedback. I'm going to lean into and learn from the success of previous champions so that I can write the best speech and tell my story in my way. Then all you have to do is buy your ticket and then you have to pick up your pen and start writing that winning story because it all starts with the first word and from there you can only go up so thank you so much it's so lovely sharing this time with you
Thank you so much, Verity. That was incredible. Thank you for sharing your insights, your amazing experiences, and of course, again, for inspiring us at this time in a much more personal setting directly to us in District 116. That was fantastic, truly. I have written so many notes, honestly. <laughs> I can share, I can share them with anyone who wants. That was amazing. Thank you again. We have 15 minutes for question and answer session or perhaps uh, 20 minutes if we can, if it's until nine, uh, sorry, 7.15. And this will again be hosted by Toastmaster Bindu. I've already introduced her before. So can you please help me in welcoming uh, Toastmaster Bindu to the screen? Thank you. Thank you, Master of Ceremony, once again. <laughs> I acknowledge the presence of all eminent leaders, distinguished guests, and my fellow Toastmaster, and world champion of public speaking, Verity Price. Warm welcome. Warm good evening from all of you. Thank you so much, Toastmaster Verity Price, for the spellbound, thrilling, and fabulous speech guidance recommendation tips on how to write a winning speech. We are inspired by your story and the transformation journey from awfulness to awesomeness. Love that. <laughs> Undoubtedly, the session was enthralling and the audience thoroughly enjoyed, which I can understand by my flooded chat box. Without further delay, let's dive on to the question answer session. So dear Toastmaster Verity Price, shall we start the question answer session? Yes. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. The first question for the session is from a guest, Jim. He is Jim Wan, who says that, how do you come up with a title of for your speech? So the title is also quite a journey and a bit like the message, your first title isn't necessarily going to be your best. The I'm trying to think, I had quite a few different titles. So the same story remained, but because I kept working with the message, the title, A Great Read, only came right at the end when I decided on Write a Different Story. Before that, it was called Change the Way You Look, which confused the audience. So they told me I needed to change that. But I think when you're coming up with your title, go, is there a way that I can create curiosity from as early as my title? Because your contest starts from the moment they announce your name. And so you might as well make that title matter and don't give away what it is that you're about to say. Make them lean in going, because and that's where a great read worked well. People go, oh, ooh, which book is this? I want to find out. I'm always looking for something to read. So look for a title that, that sparks a bit of curiosity. Curiosity is your friend with an audience. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Toro Mariyama. I think I pronounced the name correctly. She's from Tokyo, Japan. She says that I have a question to ask that I know that you are an excellent evaluator of prepared speeches, like you did it in 2005 in District 74 evaluation speech contest of which you were the champion. So a good evaluator is a good speaker. I Absolutely, wonder, yeah, uh, sorry. Still the question is there. I wonder <laughs> how evaluating other people's speech can contribute to the improvement of our speaking skill or maybe vice versa. Will you tell us a little bit of your experience? I think evaluations is where it all starts. And I won the district evaluation contest in 2015. And it's something I've loved teaching people how to evaluate speeches since then. It's my absolute passion because I think it's our biggest skill we learn in Toastmasters actually. Because if you can give someone feedback on how they can improve your own, their speech, you should be able to apply that understanding to your own speeches. And to be a good evaluator, you need to understand all the elements that go into a speech. And so this is why it is such a crucial skill. And in all the years I wasn't competing, and I know I said I didn't compete for many years, but I mentored and coached um, probably about five or six division to district contestants and two district to semifinals. So I learned from helping other speakers prepare for this contest. And so, 
be on both sides of a speech, not always the only person. You don't have to only be the person giving it. You can be on the other side as well. That's really a great input to know about it. The next question is from uh, the same speech repeated from the club to international level. And is that mandatory as well? It's not mandatory. But if you want to really experience how a speech can grow and change, then I highly recommend doing the same speech from club to the semifinals if you are lucky enough to get that far. If I mean, I actually need to make a video compilation of the first version of that speech to what I did at the semifinals. It changed so much. And again, the elements of the story stayed the same, but the delivery and the simplification of the message and tiny little things that I added in I've never grown as much as I did with that speech because I kept competing with it. The, I think the overwhelm of the finals is that's the first time that speech is being seen in a contest setting. So you haven't tested it at all and you just hope for the best. But taking one speech from club to semifinals is an extraordinary journey. The next question is from Toastmaster Ruxana Khan. She's oh, saying that... <laughs> I love Roxana. <laughs> at what point did you freeze your speech and stop making changes? So that is a very good question. I stopped asking for feedback about a week before because I was, to be honest, I was traumatized by some of the feedback I received in my journey. Some clubs, the, the Toastmasters hadn't understood the way that you give feedback and it was harsh. And I had to kind of go and lick my wounds and I lost my confidence in the lead up to the semifinals. So I actually had to learn to have the courage to say, no, thank you. I don't want any more feedback. This is my speech. And the only people I spoke to at that point was my coach, Lance Miller, and my sister, who was also my mentor. But And so even in my final speech, my sister and I were doing fun little tweaks on the last day we added in that I kissed a prince. It actually hadn't been there before, but it felt safe but I stopped getting feedback about a week before and just trusted that where I was was good enough. Thank you very much. The next question is from Toastmaster Ittisan. I think I pronounced the name correctly. Uh, with over 200 Toastmaster giving feedback, how did you know what to consider and what not to? I think this covers your answer already covered that particular question, isn't it? No, I think the thing there that was very useful for me was I was overwhelmed by all that feedback. And then I realized that what I needed to do was look for themes. So I would do the speech at three clubs. And then if in three clubs in three different countries, all were asking for the same thing, I'd go, okay, the audience wants a change. And in my semi-final speech, something that kept coming through was audience members were saying, you talk about your mom's funeral and there was a book, but you don't tell us what people said about her. And that's difficult. My speech was already over seven minutes. I had to go and take other bits out and put in what people said about her because the audience had asked for it. So look for the themes and the feedback. Don't change immediately because one person's given you their opinion. See if other people give you the same opinion and then change. Thank you very much for that also. The next question, I'm just going uh, through all the questions because it's flooded with a lot of questions. So I am trying to cover the maximum <laughs> what we can cover with the stipulated time. So the next question is from Toastmaster Sedupati. He says that, do we have to necessarily paid mentor to become a champion speaker? No, you don't. Um, in the feedback I've been getting from fellow finalists and champs, about only 33% of them paid for coaching. Although I think the paid for coaching is a newer thing because all the world champions are busy and then everyone's approaching them in contest season. So I think they have to charge for their time. So I don't think you have to, but I think there's a lot to be said for being coached by someone who's won this contest and who understands the psychology behind the winning. So not just the speech writing, but also the stress that you are under uh, when you're competing. So I will never regret the investment I made. My club also helped. They, they got behind investing in me because they knew I would bring the learning back to our club. So I think that's a personal, it's a personal choice, but one or two paid for sessions with a, a former champion or a professional coach, you're not gonna go wrong. True. 
thank you very much for that answer also. Now I move on to the next question as raised by Muhammad Bikrudin, which he says that from this, he is from District 20. He says that what is the best way to win speech to judge instead of audience? Just say that again, the best way to? The best way to winning speech to judge instead of audience. Oh, so the winning speech for the judges rather than the audience. The audience. judges are your audience. So, you know, yes, they are marking on a ballot and your audience isn't always. But if you have made your speech relevant to the audience, and that is one of the big criteria, you should be, you know, getting to your judges. And in fact, I'm wanting to work on a workshop to teach people how to use the judges ballot to write your speech, because you should be not just taking my formula of the gift, also going, let's look through that criteria and make sure I'm hitting all those marks. So write your speech with the judges ballot next to you so that you're bringing in all the elements that they're looking for. But if you've made it relevant to your audience and universal, that's going to appeal to your judges as well. Thank you. And the next question is from Nagua, a Toastmaster Nagua. She said, she asked you the question, how do you practice vocal variety? I know that you're a very good singer, <laughs> so you can answer this. I think it's just when you, when I'm practicing my speech, I play with different voices. And to be honest, vocal variety was one of the aspects that the audience often, uh, with the feedback I got when I was practicing, they'd say it could be better. I think they were looking for more. And I was also still trying to be quite authentic, so it was difficult. But vocal variety, there's very dramatic vocal variety, or it's also just going, I'm going to whisper for a bit. And, you know, so, and, and do voices and characterization. So look at the way you've written your speech. And one of the ways to bring more vocal variety in is to have elements of dialogue. A lovely little tip that I'll give you all that I learned also from Prez Vazilev's course is once you've written your speech, color code it. So whenever you're directly addressing your audience, do that in red so that you can see through your speech, there's moments of interaction. And wherever there's dialogue, do that in blue. And you, so that dialogue could be internally. So I thought to myself, really, am I crazy? Or it could be speaking to someone, but dialogue will bring your speech to life. So if you've done that in blue and you've got red for where you're interacting with the audience and bold any humor that you've got, you should be able to zoom out on your speech, maybe see it across three pages and see, is there a, a flow of energy to my speech? If it's lots of black text and there's no dialogue and there's no humor and there's no like, have you ever found that to the audience? it's probably going to be hard for them to listen to. So that's quite a nice trick to, in the writing of your speech, bring in vocal variety by adding in dialogue and emphasis points and then practicing that. Thank you very much, um, Toastma uh, Toastmaster Reality Prize. The next question, which is raised by Toastmaster Elizabeth, she asks you, uh, she's asking, Please, how do you communicate with the audience and the judge at the same time? The audience is your judge and the judge is your audience. So you actually cannot be thinking about the judges. You know, your speech is a gift for your audience. And I didn't say this earlier and I meant to say it. When you are trying to write a speech for the International Speech Contest, I want you to have this in mind. If you make the final stage, and you have seven minutes to speak to the world, what is it that you want to say? And if you approach a speech with, I have seven minutes to speak to the world, what I want to say, you will write a speech that is for the audience. So I think my biggest takeaway for all of you right now is don't be thinking about the judges. The judges are people. They have hearts. They have emotions. They're going to be moved by your story. Yes, they're going to look at the technical aspects. So you have to have great language. You need that body language. You have to use vocal variety, structure your speech. All of that has to be there. But if your message is universal and if your intention is sincere and authentic, you're going to, to blast through everything else because you are speaking to a person, not a judge. That's a wonderful answer, you know, <laughs> because all these things would be going greatly to everybody, not to the one judge or the audience. So there is another question, which is like, how many times did you practice 
your speech and how many times did you rewrite your speech? I wrote 30 versions of my semi-final speech, 32 versions of my final speech, plus four other speeches that I'd written, five or six versions of each, and then just got to a great read. I have no idea how many times I practiced, way more than 200. When I spoke at 42 clubs, I often did both speeches. I re filmed myself, refilmed myself. So it was hours. It was hours. It was exhausting. And that's why you need a mentor. You need a coach, someone to keep it fresh, to look at what you're doing, to give you suggestions. Because if you're too close to it, you, you, you stop being able to see what you're doing anymore. But it was it was a relentless amount of work. <laughs> great, that's great. Uh, now the next question is from Dave, the Toastmaster Dave, and he's saying that how has the winning the contest changed your life? What new opportunity has come to you, or have you created for yourself? So it's a huge moment when you win this. It was overwhelming, just the pouring in of messages and congratulations. And the thing that I didn't realize, and I don't think many contestants think about, is that when you win this contest, you win for the whole of Toastmasters. And suddenly you belong to Toastmasters. And everyone is saying, come speak at our district, do a workshop. And I was so exhausted. I was like, I don't have a workshop. I don't know what to teach. So you'll see now I'm only starting these now. I've given myself two months to recover. And that was uh, last year's champion, Mike Carr, phoned me the day after I won. And he said, don't do anything for two months. Let yourself recover. So that's one of the things I've done. My career has shot through the roof. I mean, I look forward to more. There's international bookings are starting to come in, which is very exciting. But it's opened up so many doors for me. And what I'm wanting to work with it is going, what else can I do to help people write different stories? So not just write winning stories, but also personally, I teach a lot around positive psychology and the habits that I took on to change my life. I wanna be able to help more people do that. And I'm hoping that the win opens those doors for me to share what I've learned with a wider audience. I'd slightly give a pause because there is a good sense of humor question which has come to me. It is a request from Toastmaster Nahar. He is saying that um, I can ask you to deliver that bag because everyone has opted for the box and he is the only one who chose the bag. So his address is 37 Doha, Qatar. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> now again, we will move on to the next question which is how did you balance acting versus looking at the lens and just talking? It's a big challenge. I, it's one of the reasons why I've always struggled with this contest in particular, because it felt like there is a lot of acting and it's not the way I speak as a professional speaker. But I think when you are in your story and you are reliving your story, those moments of interaction with someone and you're feeling it, I think the audience is right there with you. And so you've got to, it is a balance. You can't have too much of that because then they feel like they're watching a film, but sometimes it's bringing an experience to life. And I know a lot of people loved me talking to the friend and holding the fridge door and looking awkward, but I was very quick to look, to come back to them and say something. So have a little bit of interaction and then draw the audience in maybe with a humorous remark, something that, makes them realize this isn't just a acting production. It's a wonderful, great, great, great. I don't have words. <laughs> Thank you so much for a precise and edited answer, dear world champion of public speaking, Verity Price. Indeed, it's a real great learning and experience and we all benefited from that. Thank you, wow. <laughs> uh, and we know that um, still my chat box is flooding with the questions again and again. So what we will request all the dear Toastmaster, we know that there are a few questions that were unanswered as we have a time restriction. So please send the questions to District 116 PQD 
BTM Rajesh VC through his email or WhatsApp. So Thank before you. summing up, I would like to say Henry Ford, what Henry Ford has said, that anyone who stops learning is old, whether it's 20 or 80. Anyone who is learning stays young. Thank you, District 116, for arranging fantastic learning session and helping us to stay young. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for a wonderful opportunity. And I'm signing off and handing over the control to our vibrant master of ceremony, Christy Walker. The screen is all yours. Thank you Thank so you. much, Toastmaster Bindi. And thank you once again, Verity, for uh, what was a fantastic session today. Um, and expertly handle those questions, Bindu. <laughs> I imagine you had hundreds of them. So that was fantastic. Brilliant. I'd just like, before we end the session, I'd like to welcome to the screen our judge's engagement manager to give his vote of thanks. He's an aviation professional and he's been a Toastmaster for 10 years. He's a member of Doha Toastmasters and also Doha Malayalam Toastmasters Club. He said he was lucky to have a podium finish in all four categories of the District 116 contest this year. I'm not sure lucky is the word modest, but he certainly rocks the screen, which is exactly why he was there. He's a passionate speaker and an accessible to all mentor. So please let's welcome to the screen our judges engagement manager, distinguished Toastmaster Sunil Kumar Menon. Thank you, Madam of Ceremonies, uh, Toastmaster Kirsty Walker, for keeping your energy high till you introduce the person delivering the vote of thanks. What a wonderful evening it has been. So many takeaways for both parties for those aspiring to be judged and for those aspiring to manage the judges. Let me start by thanking the role players who are behind the scenes because without them, the sessions wouldn't have started and the sessions wouldn't have ended. The sessions wouldn't have started without our Zoom madam who opened the room exactly at 5 p.m. Thank you Toastmaster Bindu for setting the room for us. The session started, but I wouldn't have been giving my word of thanks yet if the sessions were not signaled to wind up. For that, we had a dedicated Toastmaster who stayed focused on the timing so that we followed the schedule and got back to our domestic commitments on time. Thank you, Toastmaster Fauzi Khan Laij. To ensure that the meeting room was monitored, we had a silent duo comprising of area director Nishi Kumar and Giridhar Kevi as our co-hosts. Thank you for staying throughout and ensuring that the event passed off glitch-free. No training session is complete without a well-satiating Q&A session. It was witnessed by all how well our Q&A host, Toastmaster Bindu Unikrishnan, conducted a seamless, well-articulated, and well-controlled session, utilizing the time prudently and moderating it efficiently. Thank you very much, Toastmaster Bindu Unikrishna. Today <clears throat> was a very special day for the members of District 116. The lady herself, who did it, surpassing 30,000 plus Toastmasters across the world, took time from her momentous months of her life to share with us her winning secrets. Thank you, world champion, for being among us and instilling in us the belief that we too can script a winning speech with white elephant experiences. Every member of District 116 joins me in wishing you that every chapter you add to your great read will multiply your glory multifold. Thank you, Verity. Thank you very much. In many Indian languages, Sham means evening and Sundar means beautiful. Our this Sham wouldn't have been so Sundar 
if it was not for Toastmaster Sham Sundar, a leader par excellence whom District 116 could always fall back upon to deliver meritoriously and meticulously. Toastmaster Sham agreed within a short notice of less than a week to be present today and share his experience. It was not at all frightening and it was all the way enlightening. The district stays indebted for your efforts to prepare us for the contests. Thank you very much, Toastmaster Sham. Finally, <clears throat> the prima donna of this evening, who opened the session with her energizing smile and took us through the district mission and call to order, stitched the segments well with her enthusiastic, well-rehearsed introduction of the dignitaries, trainers, and other role players for an event hosting a world champion. In her, we had a champion MC keeping us buoyed till the very end. Thank you, Toastmaster Kersey, for executing your role so gracefully. The district appreciates your contribution. I would also like to thank district director and district PQD for having organized this wonderful training session. I am grateful to all those amazing enthusiasts who logged in from other parts of the globe to make this event a great success. Finally, I would like to thank each and every member of District 116 who logged in to learn and support so that our district has an exemplary contest experience. Thank you, thank you, thank you. With these words, I have the honor to declare the session adjourned. Stay safe, stay blessed, good night. Yes, uh, Nishi, I think you can uh, unmute. Yeah, I've yeah. done the permission. All can people to unmute. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now. Thank you once again, Toastmaster Verity Price, for being with us at the District 116. Thank you so much. Have a group photo. Thank you, Sham Sundar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, champion. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Can we have a group photo with everyone? Yes, please. Yeah, request everyone.